It's an honor, a delight for me to introduce Jerry Rag to you this morning. We'll be bringing God's word. I was first exposed to the mentorship of Jerry Rag back in 1999. He was a pastor and a faculty member at the church and seminary that I attended. And it was a number of years later that he took a church to pastor in Jupiter, Florida. Uh, sounded like another world, and in some senses it is. Soon thereafter, my brother-in-law uh, took a, a post as a youth pastor there, and so um, we were able to have a lot of connections to that church, and uh, more mentorship and friendship grew uh, with that church and with Jerry and his ministry, and um, so thrilled that you get to hear him preach this morning. You're going to, going to get to hear his heart. I mentioned earlier, as one of his titles is a president of the Expositors Seminary, um, and that title might be a, middle, a little misleading because he is a, a pastor and a shepherd in the context of a church that just sought to see what the church ought to be doing, which is to be training pastors in the context of the local church. And uh, that has expanded to a, a vision beyond the walls of their own church, such that his uh, ministry leadership example um, have reached far and wide. And you have felt the influence of Jerry Rag and the other men in that church, whether you've known it or not, and they very like-minded, the things that they love uh, course through our veins, and I'm just so glad to introduce to you uh, my friend, my pastor, not my pastor, a pastor, the pastor at Grace Emanuel Bible Church, um, Jerry Rag. Thank you so much, Matt. Good morning. It is great to be with you today, and we do love your church. We, our church loves your church, not just because we have like-minded connections with your leadership and several of you in the congregation, but largely because of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done in our hearts in causing us to resonate about gospel ministry. So when I come here and, and I sing with you and fellowship in the worship of our great God, I'm... I'm uh, back home, really, and in so many ways, it's just like being home when we go to these places where brothers and sisters in Christ love the same things that we love about the truth and about the God that we worship, and so I consider it an immense privilege to be with you and just bring you all the greetings and love from Grace Emanuel. If you're ever interested in what we're like, just go online, check it out, and, uh, and you'll, you'll note that it's like home to you, no, no doubt about it. Thanks to the music team uh, for leading us. I love the way that God's people worship when we love the truth because our, I, I was a part of music ministry for years and, uh, and so I love to come to other ministries and to sit with God's people and, and then raise our voices to the Lord and I love it when a church knows God's word because it, it's, it's all throughout their music and their songs and so it's just a rich, rich time. It prepares my heart. As I open the Word of God with you, I just want to bow for a moment and ask the Lord to do exactly what we were singing, to prepare us for His Word. So bow with me for just a moment. Lord, you have been gracious to us, very kind. We need softening. We need you, by your Spirit, to turn over the soil of our hearts, turn it up, stir it up, that you might plant your word deep within us and that it might be food for our souls. I thank you so much for God's people in this place and for the leadership and for the ministry that takes place from here, the sphere of influence in which they serve and do gospel ministry and the loss that are reached and your kindness that is extended to sinners. And so we're grateful whenever we have the privilege of sitting under your voice this is your place, your people. This is your voice that we listen to. So make us submissive, for that is the highest form of worship, to tremble when you speak. And so we ask for your spirit to illumine our minds and to make us different and conform us to your image that we might be a holy people. And we ask it for your sake, according to your name and for your glory. Amen. So let's open our Bibles this morning to a, a text that will be familiar 
to all Christians, but most notably familiar to this church, James chapter 1, the book of James chapter 1. And you know, some passages you, uh, you walk as a Christian, it becomes familiar ground, and then there are some seasons in a Christian's life where the grass and the dirt in that particular text gets uh, flattened a little more, and then there are times and seasons in the life of a church and in people's lives where God digs a trench in those texts of Scripture, and I know and have read and have spent time uh, resonating with and connecting my heart with all that has come to this church over the last few years and most notably this last year. Our church has prayed for you, prayed for those in your midst. And I wondered about coming to a text in a church like this, not really having ever preached here before, knowing some of you, but not being an intimate fellowship with you. But I knew that because I'm a believer and because we have uh, similar experiences, even recently in our own fellowship, that this would be great ground to cover for us together. The Lord does a great work here, and one of the works that he does is probably um, at the the top of his list for why he brings difficulties to our lives. In fact, Paul says this very thing in the third chapter of Philippians. So before we dig into James, just think about what he says in the 10th verse of Philippians 3 when he's talking about the gospel. And he says of his own Christian life that when he got saved, he wanted to fellowship with the Lord in some things. One was the power of the resurrection. Well, I love that. I love the fact that I get to fellowship in the power of the resurrection because I now can say no to sin. But it is also true that he says in that text that to know the Savior intimately, I must desire to fellowship in his sufferings. To know them intimately, to enter into them, to strive against sin and to feel the weight of affliction to be in the sanctification process and and to have the trenches dug in certain texts and in your heart. And that is what we want to do this morning as we come to James chapter 1. This church is in the trench of this text in recent months and years. And standing in the middle of this text, God wants an intimate fellowship that is more in-depth than before. He wants us to enter into an affliction and a difficulty in ways that will cause us to know him more intimately, more deeply. And so we come to this text, and, and it is, as I said, familiar ground, but there is so much here that we could preach it over and over again, and, and we would find ourselves in new insight all the time. I remember when I was raising our kids at home, and they're all grown and gone now, my youngest just turned 30. We have four children, but one of my daughters, uh, back in the junior high years, was going through a a severe relational difficulty, as sometimes happens in the junior high years. And uh, but it was serious. She was being slandered, and it was a it was a serious crisis in her young life. And I remember that she was saying, "Is this really what the Christian life is going to be like?" Where where your heart gets broken over these kind of dynamics. And so we found ourselves making our way to some Old Testament texts and building a a set of principles upon which we could live in those texts, one of which was Psalm 119, and and in the 79th to the the 80th verse, or the uh, 73rd to the 80th verse, you have this section where the psalmist talks about affliction, and we built some principles off that section, particularly verse 75, when the Lord says, when the psalmist says of the Lord's affliction, in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Or literally in the old Hebrew idea, with the desire to build me up, you have afflicted me. And then we backed up to verse 67, which says, before I went astray, or before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. So there was another principle that tells us that we must be afflicted or we will go astray. We won't keep his word. I know we'd like to think it's different. We'd like to imagine that we could be sanctified without that, and we've often probably imagined it in our minds or even verbalized it in prayer. Lord, I I don't need those afflictions. I can grow. I promise. I promise. I'm on it. I can grow. I don't need those more serious afflictions. 
But the psalmist admits right up front what we all ought to admit. Before I was afflicted, I did go astray. But now because I'm afflicted, I keep your word. Because I've walked through the trench of that passage and that trial, I, I keep your word more. I have more intimate fellowship with you. I, I can walk with you in a greater way. Absolutely. And so my daughter and I built on that principle. And then, then we walked our way into the New Testament and found our, ourselves in Philippians 3.10 and I said to her, Brianna, this is the way that you learn to know the Lord more intimately and to fellowship in his sufferings. A Christian ought to want that. We would like to choose the path of least resistance, but a Christian ought to desire to know Christ at that level. And so we, we have to ask ourselves the question, what do you want? How deeply and closely do we want to walk with Christ and know him? That's a scary thing. I've often been praying, Lord, help me grow in my faith. But then that John Newton hymn comes up in my mind when he says, I ask the Lord that I might grow in faith and love and every grace, might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face. And then in the middle of the song, he says, instead of the Lord just overpowering my sin, he made me see the hidden evils of my heart. And he brought inward trials, and then that great chorus, these inward trials I now employ from self and pride to set you free and break your schemes of earthly joy until you seek your all in me. There, there is the question, what do we want? Well, in order to, to lay a foundation for wanting the right thing, this is what James does here in chapter 1. Notice what he says, and again, familiar words, but don't gloss over them simply because they've been preached or read. James, of course, is talking to the tribes who are dispersed in heavy persecution, and he says in verse 2, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, and it is this God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith, without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind, for that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Very simple. James sets forth two overarching and drivetrain principles here. The first is going to have to do with receiving and accepting whatever God brings into your life right up front. So we'll just call it, you, you need to nurture a humble faith the moment you walk into something you did not expect. Note, he says here, when you encounter various trials. Absolutely, the, the terminology here is unmistakable. <laughs> James is saying, this, this stuff comes upon you. you. It falls upon you. you. You trip into it. You stumble into it. You go around a corner, and there it is. And we've all always heard Christians who are more mature say to us with, with compassion and warning, you're either going to be coming out of an affliction or in the middle of affliction or heading into affliction. This is the Christian life. And this is what James indicates very honestly here. Affliction is a part of fallen living as the sparks fly upward, Job said. So in the same way the heat takes the spark from the fire into the sky, it's inevitable. So you will encounter and trip into and stumble into various afflictions. You're either in one, you're either entering one, or you're either coming out of one. This should not surprise the Christian. Moreover, you ask yourself, what do you want? Do you want to know Christ intimately? And, and if you do, then you're going to want to fellowship in his sufferings. The infirmities of Christ, the pains that he took upon himself, the way he entered into the striving against sin and loved us, John 13, one says, to the uttermost, to the nth degree. As far as anyone could go to save a sinner, he went. 
And if you're going to know him intimately, then you're going to have to know immense humiliation, as he did. You're going to have to know torment of conscience, as he did. You're going to have to know physical limitations, as he did, in all the ways that he felt when he took upon himself humanity. You're going to have to know the struggle against the, the, the flesh, the temptations that come from outside. And, of course, he without sin, so he never yielded to sin, so he felt temptation in a, in a way we can't fathom. You understand that? He felt temptation so powerfully and so furiously because he never yielded to it. We stop feeling it when we give in. Temptation's over when we give in. He never gave in. You're going to have to feel that. You're going to have to feel the incomparable level of assault from Satan and his forces of evil. You're going to have to be involved in times in, in what appears to us inconceivable afflictions that come upon us, and then you're going to have to enter into what it means to, to know that he bore your guilt, a foreign guilt to him. It's not foreign to us at all. We are born with the taste of guilt and sin in our mouths. He never knew any of it, and yet it was foisted upon him. It was foreign to him. He recoiled at it in the garden and even the writer of Hebrews says, look, if you've forgotten what the scriptures say, that the Lord loves whom he chastens and he scourges those whom he receives, then don't forget, you, you've never suffered under blood and you're striving against sin. What does that mean? Martyrdom. I mean, none of us have suffered under blood and martyrdom, otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here in our striving against sin. So ultimately... There has to be a way to nurture a response heading into an affliction, in the middle of an affliction, at the end of an affliction. There has to be a way to access the Spirit's power, and it begins by, first of all, nurturing a humble response, a humble faith as you encounter these various difficulties you were not expecting. You have to nurture a humble faith. Notice what he says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter the various trials. It's interesting here that James begins with the, the humility of one's disposition or the attitude of humility before he describes the trials. He even mentions it here before he describes the theological underpinnings. So he's going to talk about trials. The, the second point is going to be arming yourself with, with right thinking and biblical theology about the trials. But before he even goes there, he steps out front and says, there is something in your disposition that has to be right up front when you encounter an affliction. And he says, I want you to consider this trial something to rejoice over, even if you don't yet see its outcome, even if the endurance it will produce is way off, even if you hadn't even read the verse next to this one. Out of the gate, your disposition toward God is at stake. And you're to nurture then a humility that entrusts yourself to God before you even see the thing unfold or are tested as to its dimensions. And you want to nurture this humble faith up front. In fact, that's this whole verbiage here, to make a resolution through faith. That's the, that's the verbiage here, the tense of this language. It indicates a decisive act, a nurturing of a conviction to live and die by. This is what you will believe. Regardless of what you've seen, regardless if you just entered it, regardless of whether it's on the horizon, you, you haven't yet gone into it, or you're in the middle of it, and, and you sit under the word of God and this passage First thing you must do is nurture a humility that entrusts oneself to God because he's God. To entrust oneself to God because he's God. And this is to be a resolution. It assumes preparation then. This assumes that before there is a test, you are thinking your way through how you nurture a humble faith in the rest of your life. When God's word is preached, do you submit to it? When uh, you know what principles you're supposed to live in your marriage. They, they happen upon you, and they're right there in the moment, and you can live them. Are you living them? When you know you could starve your pride in a given area, and you're suddenly put to the test, are you starving your pride in that area and entrusting yourself to a faithful God who judges righteously? 
as Jesus tells us we ought to do from his example, 1 Peter 2. Are you doing that? In any of your given weaknesses, are you going before the Lord and saying, Lord, it, when, when this confronts me, when this weakness is, is brought to the surface by a test or a temptation from the world, Satan, or my flesh, am I nurturing a, a willingness to humble myself in faith, entrusting myself to your character before I even know anything about what's ahead of me? That is the language James uses, James uses here. Right up front, you are to make a decision. You are to build a conviction. You're to nurture a humble faith. And what will, what will that faith look to? Notice he says, consider it, consider it something. Consider it joyful or unmixed rejoicing. Unmixed cause for rejoicing is probably a, a best way to expand the translation. Unmixed meaning um, only joy, all joy. That's why he says all. It, there is nothing about what God takes us through that is going to miscue. There's nothing about what God is going to produce in the affliction that is going to be a mistake on his part. We're never out of his care. These are tailor-made. They're perfect. His timing is never off. His wisdom is never off. The people he puts around you in the midst of it is never off. We're off, but he's not off. And so that is what he is saying. At the beginning of a test, you are to make a a decision, a decisive moment of faith whereby you submit to God for who he is and you're doing that for the sake of the rejoicing that's going to come because it is God who has tailor-made the test and he has brought it your way without making any mistakes. Like the old Spurgeon comment, he is too wise to be mistaken. And he's too good to be unkind. The old songwriter then took that one step further and said, when you don't understand and you can't trace his hand, you trust the heart of God. You trust the character of God even when you know nothing about what's ahead. This is, this is what it means to consider this all joy. A conviction is to be nurtured. It's nurtured by faith. And when it's nurtured by faith, you are saying at the beginning, at the outset, God's character is unassailable. God's character cannot be accused ever. You are just when you judge, David said in Psalm 51, even as a consequence to his sin. Psalm 119, the psalmist says, in faithfulness you've afflicted me, and the line just before it was, your judgments are righteous. All your decisions are righteous. All of them. You always do what's right. And I'm never to question your character even entering into a difficulty. It will be joy. The outcome will be joy, as we'll see in a moment. But you must consider your suffering not as an end in and of itself. You're to resolve to submit yourself in humble faith to God, to be brought low. I think of Numbers 10 when, when Aaron's sons offered strange fire. And they were killed on the spot. And the text says that Aaron said nothing. He kept silent. That is this moment right here. That is Aaron in a consecrated formal role before a holy God saying, I trust your character. Something went wrong. My sons, whom I also consecrated and was thrilled that they were in the line and they were performing the service. My sons are now dead. You're not mistaken. If I don't figure this out, I know this, I'm considering it cause for rejoicing in what you are doing because you are a God who does not err. And Aaron was silent over the corpses of his boys. Faith, beloved, faith is exercised when we're forced to entrust ourselves exclusively to God alone, to his good and righteous character. When you're put in a position where there is nothing else you can turn to, where there is no one else to turn to, there is no other human resource to stand on, and your own ability to reason through what you've just entered into is gone. You're at the end of you. That is what Paul describes in 2 Corinthians 12 when he says, when I am weak, then I am what? I'm strong. At the end of me, I can only turn to God. His character is all I have. 
Just exactly what we were singing moments ago. All I have is Christ. Not merely for my conversion, but for the power to sustain me when he is about to sanctify me through something very challenging. So the first thing is to nurture a humble disposition. Right out of the gate, James does not equivocate. He's not soft on it before he even discusses the theology that you're to arm yourself with and your perspective of trials and tests. He says, I want you to make a decision right up front. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tested beyond your ability to respond righteously to the test and endure it. He is going to do some things through it, whether you know it or not. His character must be trusted. And if you want to begin to walk into these things, as mature Christians do, when you look at them and you marvel and you, you, you say, I want to be like them, if you want to do that, you, you must want to fellowship with the sufferings of Christ to such a degree that you say, with Christ, not my will but yours. And it takes supernatural grace to do that. And the only way to access that supernatural grace from the Spirit is to have a moment in the front end of humble entrustment. You know what it means to have faith? To believe God is is to have a conviction of things you don't see or don't feel. It's not about feeling something or, or having some subjective experience that you can exercise faith. Not at all. Faith is entrusting yourself to God as a conviction before you even realize any promise, before you realize any result, before you realize anything, before you you are fulfilled in any of the, the outcome. Before any of that, you entrust yourself to him. It means to place yourself at his disposal utterly and completely, as Jesus did when he entrusted himself to him who judges righteously, even though he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. So that's the first principle that that digs the trench here that we live in when we encounter these very difficult and strange circumstances that come upon us for our good, he says, I want you to make a decision about it. And it's going to be a decision of humble faith. And that's how you'll access the power of the Spirit to to have your eyes opened and your heart opened and softened and your perspective changed and your discernment built. But then he, he does something marvelous and it's so gracious of the Lord. He could have left it there. Trust my character, move on. And maybe there are moments when we enter a trial, some points in our lives where you just don't have a Bible accessible and your mind is confused because of the trauma and you, you, verses aren't coming to mind. And there are times when God leaves you with just the knowledge that, that he is your savior and he is your God and that's all you know. Your theology proper is intact, but you don't have any further design and witness about trials. It's just not going to come to your mind. Sometimes God leaves you in that place. But what a gracious, gracious hand of the Lord to do what he does here in this passage. So consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. And then this. This is why you're able to, in the access of the power of the Spirit, do this. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and you are to let this endurance have its perfect result. That's, that's the trajectory. It's inevitable. And the purpose is that you may be complete, that you may be perfect, that you may be maturing so that you end up lacking in nothing when it comes to a test. So we'll call this principle arming yourself with truth about tests. You must build in your mind a framework, and that framework's got to go to work all the time. It's, it's like a muscle you exercise. You build in your mind a set of principles from a text like this that go to work every time you face something or someone else face, faces something and you come alongside them. So you build into your mind an ability to look further than where you're at for what God's going to do, and that, that actually comes through the affliction. And God is going to do it because he wants to wean us off of ourselves, wean us off of other people, and bring us to him in new ways that we might fellowship with him in an intimate way and be more useful. Some years ago, an article appeared in Focus on the Family publication about a middle-aged woman in a very difficult trial that she had. I was fascinated to read it. I couldn't put it down. Her husband of many years and many faithful, godly years had been killed in this tragic automobile accident and... He was a recognized leader in the church, as the story goes. His reputation was one of integrity and faithfulness. 
Together they had raised godly children whose families were now serving the Lord. And, and so the, the loss of a stalwart like that in the church was absolutely devastating. The, the pain was indescribable. And late one evening, she thumbed reminiscently through his wallet, and she found a picture of an unfamiliar woman who was scantily clad in the photo. On the back, she read the woman's thank you note, as the story goes, along with her husband's initials. And her heart sank in disbelief. Over the next several hours, through agonizing tears, her mind raced from one memory to the next, only to have each one just absolutely shattered by the discovery of her husband's deceit. And she decided not to tell her children, but rather leave them with the pleasant memories of his godly life, the father that they trusted. And then she would, would quietly and secretly live with the haunting reality that somehow uh, her husband had another life and was cleverly hidden from her. Her dependence upon God was all she had in that moment to cling to. She was closer to him now than she'd ever been, she states in the article. She starts to delineate the spiritual lessons of that. And about a week later, she received a call from someone asking about the book that she had bought at the garage sale. And her husband loved baseball stories, and so she purchased the book for him as a gift. And now she didn't need it. The caller expressed his desire to buy the book back at considerable increased cost. And she thought that was strange, she said in the article. But she agreed, nevertheless, she had no need of the book now. And when the stranger arrived, he, he sheepishly asked for the book. She gave it to him and asked why he'd had such a strong interest in it. And with an embarrassed look, he explained that he left a picture of his girl, girlfriend between the pages and wanted it back. And with her heart racing, the woman asked for the man's name and his initials matched that of her husband. When the man left, she said, she began to pray, thanking God for bringing the truth to light and setting her heart at rest about her husband's character. But she had a whole bunch of unanswered questions, she said, because she was confused about God's love and compassion. After all, her, man, her, her husband indeed was the man that she thought that she'd always known him to be. Why would God allow her to spend more than a week living with the thought that her husband was a horrible sham? And in the subsequent weeks, she said God gave her the answer, and it was profound. She explained that all her Christian life, she'd relied a great deal on the spiritual strength of her husband. Many times God had called her to walk deeply with him, but she found it much easier to live with the deep spirituality of her husband vicariously, leaving him to do the hard work. She would get caught up in the busyness of raising a family, all the while neglecting her own much-needed time with the Lord. God had used this part of the trial to teach her that personal dependence upon him and a deepening fellowship are essential to spiritual strength and usefulness. How ironic that what her husband had modeled for years, she experienced only when she thought he wasn't a model at all. It illustrates, of course, for us what is essential in our perspective, when we begin to arm ourselves with a right understanding of tests. And that's what you have here. James says if you're going to get to the inevitable result of the trajectory and have this complete and maturing result, endurance. By the way, that's the word that means to willingly remain under with joy. To remain under it, to not kick against the goads, to not fight it, to not raise up all kinds of grumbling and disputing, as Philippians 2 says in verse 14. To throw up arguments against God all day long. This is what we sometimes do. This is our inevitable habit. God is patient, but he's determined. He wants to rid us of that tendency. And so how do we do that? Well, we arm ourselves with truth about the trial, the first of which is that this has a perfect result that you may endure. He wants you to be able to remain under willingly with strength and joy that causes other believers strength and joy and causes unbelievers to marvel at the power of the gospel. And as I said at the beginning, we do not imagine we need that to get there. We will actually make excuses before God and say to him, even in prayer, I, I, I'm afraid of that. I don't need that. I can be sanctified. You don't need to go that road with me. I, I can fellowship intimately with you. Oh, let me this Sunday with my favorite song really crank up my closeness with you, God. No. The testing of your faith 
produces the endurance. The testing of your faith. Our faith must be exercised in new ways, in deeper ways, in more struggling ways, in more multifaceted ways. And so he says, you have a truth to arm yourself with. You know the reason. It is to increase your faith. You know the reason. It is to increase your ability to willingly stay under it, your endurance. You know, we, we have thought about trials in a culture like ours in, in ways that really to, to generations in the past and even Christians who live globally uh, and they don't live here, we have thought about it far different than they do. In a culture like ours, we're coddled. Our, our, our comforts are coddled. And we are so graciously dealt with by God that when suddenly he puts us through an affliction, we think he's unfair. When actually there are hosts of believers, peers, brothers and sisters in Christ who live with difficulties that are unimaginable and they remain under them. He says, we're to arm ourselves with a perspective that says, look, your, your, the goal here is to learn to remain under it. Why? Because maturity of character and understanding are attained that way. It is the only path. Verse 4, let endurance have its perfect result, its completing result, that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. You cannot mature without it. You will not mature without it. And if you remain under it, and you're willing, and you're cultivating and nurturing humble faith in the middle of it, some things are going to happen. The more you patiently endure and stand up under the difficulty, the more God then begins to display his power and his mercy and his love and his kindness and grace in intimate ways that are infused into your mind. Your mind is renewed. Your reasoning is changed. Your discernment is built. That's just what's going on in you, let alone the people you're beginning to affect. And you've seen that in recent trials here in this church. I was blessed to meet you. My family's read the stories and kept up on the trial in your family's life. And it's precious. My, my kids will be glad that I was able to say hello and confirm what we had read in many ways, that, that you, by faith, have humbled yourself under the mighty hand of God and it has produced endurance, more importantly, in your heart. It has brought you in an intimate closeness with power, mercy, love, kindness, grace, and peace that now exudes from your family's life. What is going to be the result? Well, he's now increased your usefulness in ways you yet haven't even seen realized. And in our families and in our discipleship and in others... All that now is going to change because someone has brought themselves under a test and endured willingly, faithfully, humbly. And then he's going to increase your usefulness in the depth of your worship of him. That is to say, you are carried into the throne of grace in different ways than before. And then in your courage, there will be those who lose heart, and you'll be able to come alongside them in courageous moments of, of instruction and correction. And beloved, that will be no more needed than when your children in your own family need gospel courage and don't understand what God is doing in those very form formative years. Parents who have suffered have a, and they've suffered well and learned endurance, have a gospel impact on their children like no other? Why? Because they demonstrate the power of the gospel in ways that when we resist trials and we take the path of least resistance, our gospel is verbal, largely verbal. But when you go through an affliction and you come out the other side and endurance has had its perfect result and you're perfect and mature and lacking in nothing, now it's more than verbal. They can see the power on display, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4. The gospel's in this earthen vessel, and, and we're beat up and knocked down so that the power may be of God and not of ourselves. When someone has lived like that, you will not hear trite platitudes from them. 
little, little cheap comforts from them, you won't hear that. It'll be insight. It'll be food for your soul in the moment. It'll be rich passages of scripture that they've lived, they've walked. They are now more useful in their worship and bringing you to the place where you understand God and you submit to him in worship. Their courage is more useful. Their ability to discern is greater and tighter. Their love of holiness and purity is more rich and intense. Their friendships are more uh, challenging. I love that. When somebody goes through an affliction and they live well through it, suddenly their group of friends is about to be challenged because that person isn't going to emerge from their prayer time and say nothing about the way you're living, about the cheap things you're involved in. They're not. They're going to challenge us. They're going to make us uncomfortable. People who come through trials well become uncomfortable friends in your circle. And that's good. That's how the Lord stirs things up. I'll tell you something else that happens. Those individuals see needs differently. They see people's needs with much greater clarity and multidimensional. And they see people's lives in 4D. It's just richer um, discernment about needs that need to be met, spiritual needs. They can go deeper in their counsel. They can offer things that the more shallow individual who resists trials uh, cannot offer. I love that. God is able to display his power in ways that are unique. God wants to be able to use us as a vessel to display himself and his glory. And if we can stand with patience under the most difficult human conditions and not curse God as Job's wife thought Job might and as Satan accused God of protecting him and preventing illegitimately, if you can stand under such things and not curse God when the rest of the world drowns in helplessness, God is on display. Why? What was it Satan was accusing God of? Well, if you take... If you leave someone to the evil of this world and the affliction of it, they will lose their faith. And God is saying to Satan, even when he takes Job through what he takes him through, no, when I give my faith, when I give someone faith and I uphold it with my power, it cannot be lost. And he mocks the power of evil to destroy someone's faith when they go through such things. And God loves to mock evil as it runs its course, he will finally deal with it, but he loves it when Christians mock it by the power of God in their life. He loves that. We look at the pain side of it and the trauma side of it, and we get all nervous for people. Hey, enter into their pain. As, as Peter says in 1 Peter 3, be of one emotion. Be sympathetic. It's a great word in the New Testament. Enter into people's struggle. It's not merely relatable tears. It's you enter into their pain. It's traumatizing. But that's not the issue. The issue is when they come out comforting you by scripture and truth, they've become more useful in your life. I remember hearing years ago that there was a hundred year anniversary of psychoanalysis, big convention, top five psychoanalysis guys in a panel discussion, and the, the question on the table was, what one principle is universal to all psychoanalytical studies and psychological studies? What one principle is universal that's come out of 100 years of this discipline that, that everyone can use, and it has brought comfort to them? And of the five, there, was only, uh, there were no universal principles. They couldn't find any that were foolproof. And the, the top guy, the, the giant intellect of the five said, I've always found it helpful in a difficulty to hum a tune. So, 100 years, a convention, the, the top guys, the only principle in life's afflictions that they could think of that could really comfort you, perhaps, maybe, is to hum a tune. Uh, musical, I like to hum tunes, but... Tell that to the Wycliffs who received word on March 21st, 1971 that their missionary friends, Walt and Bonnie Steinkraus, 
and were violently buried in a section of mountain that broke loose and just consumed the village. Tell, tell them to hum a tune. There's no hope in any of that. As, as our time is going here, note what James says next. This is absolutely thrilling what he says next. If any of you lacks wisdom, and he means wisdom to deal with these various things we encounter, let him ask of God. Don't you love that? Why? Because God is not stingy with his wisdom. And frankly, when I look at my life, he ought to be. Shouldn't he? How many times has he given you wisdom, a church, leaders, good preaching? You sit here mightily privileged. Counselors, leaders, disciples, mature people, people who've walked through trials with great faith, and that's all at your disposal. And how have you used it? How have we used it? I've been preaching for 25 years. I, I think it's pathetic, my track record and my scorecard. And I go back to God, and it says, if you lack wisdom, ask of God. So I ask of God. And it should say, who has given to you in the past, and you've squandered it, so you're going to get a little bit. And if you squander that, don't come back. The well is dry for you. To which I would rightly respond, if I were in my right mind, I deserve it. I've squandered so much wisdom you've given me, God. I haven't used it over here. I've complained over here. I've squandered it again over here. I, I've had responsibility and stewardship to give it to this person. I didn't give it to them. And I feared, feared man rather than you over here. And I had lusts I didn't want to deal with over here. And, and James says, if you encounter one of these seasons where it's unexpected and it's difficult, I want you to do something. I want you to go back to God who gives to all generously. You say, yeah, but, but what if I've squandered it in the past? Note the next line. He gives to all generously and without reproach. What does that mean? It means he does not say to you, look, I'm going to dole out only what, what I know is guaranteed going to be used because you know what? You squander it all the time and, and I've kept a scorecard on you. No. No. Even if you've misused it before, you come, you come to God. You come to your God and my God. You come to the only source of wisdom for dealing with these things. Let him ask of God. And there's an urgency to the verbal idea here. that When, it, when it's translated in the New Testament, let him do this, there's, there's often this urgency here. Yeah, let him do that. Let him only do that who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. One condition. And you've already had it back in verse 2, so if it's still living from verse 2 through verse 3 through verse 4 through verse 5, then you won't have any problem meeting verse 6. But let him ask in faith without any doubting. Oh, that's difficult, isn't it? That's really difficult because by the time you get to verse 5, you're thinking, thank you, Lord, thank you, I can come to you and you're not stingy and you're generous and I'm asking. And you remember, James will later chide us for how we ask or the fact that we don't ask. You remember, he says you crave things and you, you want things and you don't get them and so you fight and you quarrel, James chapter 4. And then he says, some of you don't ask God for anything at all. That's why you don't have what you, what you need because you don't ask God for it. That, that happens. God is always supplying for our needs and caring for us, but we often squander opportunities to ask him for things because we think self-sufficiency or I don't need it or I'm embarrassed or whatever the fear of man or sinful tendency is. And then James goes one step further and says, I know you do pray for some things, but you don't even get those answered because you want to spend it on your own pleasures. Well, here, in a test, we could say, when you go to God and you ask this generous God who gives to all men and without reproach, when you go to him, you must not then have two allegiances. The double-minded man is two souls. He, he's, 
He's two individuals in terms of your allegiance, what you're banking on, what you're trusting in. On the one hand, he says, God, I need help in the trial, and so I'm entrusting myself to you and your resources, but if, if my stipulations aren't met, I, I have to do it myself. I've got to trust in me or men or human things or circumstances, horizontal things. And James says, no, when you come to this generous God, do not doubt that he's there with the resources. He's hearing you. He loves you in Christ. He sees you as he sees his son. You are a legitimate son. He brings pressure to increase your virtue. You are to see yourself as a legitimate son. In fact, if you were without chastening and without trials, Hebrews 12 says, you are not legitimate sons and daughters. But you go to him as a legitimate child of God, and you go and you have one allegiance. Lord, you're all I have. You're my only resource. I know it will produce perfection, maturity. I know that because you said it will, and you, you don't lie. And I know it's tailor-made because you're a generous God who gives wisdom in the test, and you have promised in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, you won't allow any test to crush my faith. You nurture faith. You don't crush it. You bring the strength of faith to the top, and you strengthen it further by exercising that muscle in a tailor-made Struggle. I know that about you. And I don't have two allegiances. I, I won't have two ways that I say my life can be taken care of. One is you, one is me. I won't get in the way. I, I reject that. I repent of it. And you're going to have to do this not just at first, but every moment through the test. I reject my own allegiance, Lord. I reject myself and my own resources. I deny me. That is sinful. It is wicked to trust me. And that is what James says. Utter faith with full request, full asking. It doesn't have to be a sophisticated prayer. The Holy Spirit translates it to the Father according to what he sees in your heart. You, you don't have to be eloquent about any of that. The Holy Spirit's going to take your prayer, Romans 8 says, and and he's going to work all things together for your good. So he's going to communicate your heart to the Father because he knows the heart and the secret things of the life. It's not a great guarantee. My prayer can sometimes get pretty messy and uninformed and lacking in depth. But you come and you come in faith. And if you come in faith without any doubting, that means you've got to confess doubt. I love that he put that phrase in there. He didn't just say come in faith. He said, if you see doubting, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Then you're going to receive what you're asking for, wisdom in the test. But the one who does not ask in faith, he's not going to receive anything from the Lord because he has two allegiances. He's not arming himself with truth about a test. Sometimes you walk over this passage in in your Christian life in a well-worn path. Sometimes you flatten the grass and the dirt a lot because of certain seasons, and other times you dig a trench. Whichever stage of your spiritual growth you're in, this, this is where you live. You, at the front end of a difficulty, humble yourself under the character of God, the mighty hand of God, and he will bring about an exaltation of his glory through your life at the proper time. But you are to arm yourself with truth about the trial. That is to say, this ought to be the way you reason. This is how you renew your mind. This is what the Spirit wants to do, is change the way you think about these things. So we know that it produces the ability to remain under it with joy. Not emotional joy in the trial. You're going to weep, you're going to cry. In fact, James later says, be miserable, mourn and weep so that God can then bring about a transformation. Sometimes you're commanded to weep. I don't know what happened with this teaching that said we're to always have glad emotions. God commands you to rejoice, but that can't mean glad emotion because James says in chapter 4, be miserable, mourn and weep. What are we supposed to do with that? No, the joy you're, you're considering and having a conviction of is is what God is doing and who he is and what he's going to produce and how he's going to make you useful and how he's generous. He's going to make you fellowship with him in a deeper way. And that's what you want. That's what you want. You don't want to be like the 
the Christian described in 1 Corinthians 3, who when you meet the Lord, you were given a bunch of resources and you did nothing with them. You just lived for yourself and you are converted and you receive the inheritance and you get into heaven, but there's a lot of wood, hay, and stubble hanging around the old life that gets burned up in the presence of Christ's glory. You don't want to be like that. What do you want? You want to fellowship with Christ intimately? And you're going to have to fellowship in the power of his resurrection. You're going to have to fellowship with his sufferings. Paul said, I want that more than anything. You think that scared Paul to pray that? He's one of us. Surely must have. After which he must have quickly prayed, Lord, help my unbelief. Bow with me for a moment. Again, Lord, you have turned up the fallow ground and you've given us riches from your word and we have to get past the meager way that we think about it and speak about it and, and allow your spirit to do his work. We are afraid. We are timid. Lord, we're weak. We're coddled in this culture. We coddle our lives. We, we don't think deeply enough about these things. And then even when dear friends in our midst go through these struggles and we see the power that you produce in their lives, we sometimes will even shrink back and think, oh, I admire it, but I don't want to go through it. Lord, may we long not for the pain of tests, but may we long to be weaned from ourselves. May we long to know you in an intimate level like that and to walk with you carefully and faithfully. And may we be made more useful because of it, more able to glorify you because of it, to walk with you and to strengthen others. What a, what a grace to use our maturity to bring others to Christ and be with them forever in eternity. Lord, dispel our fear. Help us to humble ourselves at the outset, nurturing a humble faith and arming ourselves with truth about the tests. Strengthen us in these things, we pray for your sake. Amen.